Jersey. I'm here. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Whatever, whatever this is we got going here. I appreciate uh, you being here. Yeah, man. Me too. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Hopefully, it's a it's a benefit to your listeners too. I, I think it'll be awesome. All right, I want to jump in. If you're if you're okay with that, I want to dive right in. The 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 theme of this one here is endotoxin, and and basically, if if we want to live a life full of energy that's playful, where where we're thoughtful, we're inquisitive, we're exploratory, we're curious, and we're just living a great life, that that's that's rather incompatible with having a, an endotoxic load that's high. Um, right. And 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 so there's this thing called endotoxin. Um, what is it? I think a lot of people feel like there's something going on, but but it's it's kind of like a nebulous thing. Like we don't quite know what to what to what it is, where it comes from, what to call it, um, and and yet it's it seems to be like an elephant in the room. Like it's there. Um, so it's it's kind of got both those things at once. So, so endotoxin. I mean, what 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 is endotoxin? Because I feel like a lot of people don't really know what this is and, and what it does. So I mean, part of the part of the explanation is contained in the name, right? It's endo and then toxin, right? So it's it it comes from the idea that it's a toxin produced internally in our bodies, and the name came from um, back in like from the uh, late 19th and early 20th century when they distinguished between endotoxins that are internal and exotoxins, which are the external ones. So so for the endotoxin, basically another name for it is lipopolysaccharide, and that's actually the more scientific name. And endo, what endotoxin is, is this molecule, it's a rather large molecule that is part of the wall of gram-negative bacteria that, that lives in our intestines. And basically, it's, it's, it helps the bacteria because it stabilizes its membrane and it protects the bacteria from a number of different assaults from the outside, including antibiotics, right? So it's, very, it's, it's vital and it's very important for the bacteria. The problem, um, the problem occurs when either the bacteria dies or the bacteria starts to divide and multiply. In both of these cases, this endotoxin is basically starts to leak out of the bacterial cell. And then, um, depending on on basically how how the, the 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 gut barrier of the person is functioning, even even with a well functioning gut barrier, even if this endotoxin stays mostly inside the intestine, it still causes a localized intestinal inflammation because it reacts with with receptors on the wall of the intestine. And basically, even if it was just localized to the intestine, you still it's still going to make you feel a little bit, you know, nauseous, um, this general feeling of malaise, et cetera, et cetera, and potentially even lead to diarrhea. I mean, that's that's actually one of the most common symptoms. If you do have a high endotoxin load, typically it, it basically it leads it leads uh, it leads to diarrhea. And the reason it leads to diarrhea is because when endotoxin interacts with the uh, enterochromaffin cells in the intestine, they start producing serotonin. And serotonin is the actual direct cause of the of the diarrhea. So the problem, because um, the much serious problem is that over time, as basically if if this endotoxin load or endotoxin release continues unabated, uh, little by little the the gut barrier of the intestine starts to get compromised. So the question is then why is this endotoxin being released? Well, one obvious example is if you take an antibiotics and they're killing the bacteria, you may have a, a brief period when you know while the bacteria is being killed and cleared out of the intestine, you may have like a brief period of endotoxin being released in the intestine at higher than normal levels, right? But then what, that's really not the problem because it's, it's, it's an acute event, it's relatively short-lived, and because you're taking the antibiotic afterwards, you're going to have a much lower bacterial count in your intestine, so there'll be less endotoxin. The bigger problem, which goes on for decades, is it happens that, just like I said, bacteria release endotoxin under two circumstances. Either when the bacteria is dying and the, the cell is the bacterial cell is disintegrating, or the bacteria is feeding and starts to multiply. So, what feeds the bacteria in our intestines? Well, undigested food, uh, 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 you know, among all things. And actually, that's probably the, the that's, that's the main cause, probably, of chronic both bacterial overgrowth and the the, the chronic low grade endotoxemia, which is the chemical uh, the, the medical name for this condition. So what happens is that uh, we're being we're being advised all the time to eat these so-called resistant starches, right? Resist resistant carbs, yeah. And those are resistant to degradation slash metabolism in the stomach and the small intestine, which means that a, a good portion of them reach the colon in undigested form. And that's actually that's 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 great for the bacteria there because that's what the bacteria uses as food to multiply. Mm -hmm. So 
whenever the bacteria gets food, guess what's going to happen? The bacterial colony is going to expand. And like I said, during this division and, and basically and, and the expansion of the colony and the multiplication of the bacteria, this endotoxin gets released into the colon. So since we all eat all the time, pretty much, I mean, I don't want to say 24-7, but we, we do it every day at regular intervals. And if we follow these guidelines of eating poorly digestible foods, what we're doing is that we're providing this bacteria with tremendous amount of food, with tremendous opportunity for growth and for multiplication. And consequently, we are under a, a chronic endotoxin assault, our intestine is. And over time, the chronic inflammation of the intestine which is what this endotoxin release causes, little by little, it breaks down this, this gut barrier. So over time, you're, gonna, you're going to start seeing a little bit of this endotoxin starts to get into the bloodstream. And, and basically, once it gets into the bloodstream, it's treated the same way as if you have an actual bacteria into your bloodstream. So this endotoxin activates a receptor on many different cells, some of them part of the immune system, and that receptor is called TLR4 toll-like receptor 4. And that is the primary receptor for detecting external pathogens. So the, the body has a very good reason for having that receptor, right? I mean, if you have a, if you have a bacterial infection in your blood or in, in an organ somewhere, the body would like to know, and that's, what in, that's how it musters up an immune response. But if, but if this is a fake alarm, basically an, an endotoxin, in other words, not an actual bacteria, but just this component of the bacteria, which by itself, does, it doesn't really cause infection, but it causes the same immune response as if there is an infection there. Now, if, if, it, was only, if it was only activating the immune system, that would be actually uh, not that much of a problem. But what, additional things that it does is that, just as I mentioned, it increases the synthesis of serotonin, it increases the synthesis of nitric oxide. And the reason it, it, uh, nitric oxide releases increases is that nitric oxide is actually the primary endogenous defense against bacterial infection. So whenever, whenever you have infection, the, the body ramps up its production of nitric oxide because nitric oxide is toxic to, it's also toxic to our cells as well. So if this this is okay if you have if you're dealing with an acute bacterial infection and you want and you want this to be taken care of to at least be brought under control. But imagine what happens if this is done constantly. Now this nitric oxide, just like almost everything else in the body that has powerful acute effects, it comes at a cost. And the cost is decreased metabolism, right? So just as I said, uh, uh, you know, earlier, like if this happens, let's say like once in a blue moon for a few days, uh, your organism is not going to suffer much from having its metabolism down regulated for a few days. But if this happens on a daily basis and probably throughout the day, throughout the entire day, and even at, at night when we, if we had a big dinner, then this means over time, we're going to have a chronic elevated nitric oxide, chronic elevated serotonin, both of which are the primary inhibitors of oxidative metabolism. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, um, uh, basically by activating this TLR4 receptor, the endotoxin um, starts, uh, basically causes the organism to start releasing these inflammatory mediators called the eicosanoids and a number of different interleukins, such as, you know, and also TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. All of these are powerful inflammatory mediators, especially the eicosanoids, which, are, which include their own metabolites, by the way, of PUFA. So, so what happens is that endotoxin not only causes this hyperserotonin, hypernitric oxide condition, but it also triggers the metabolism of PUFA into the much more dangerous substances, such as the prostaglandins, the, the thromboxanes, the leukotrienes, um, the, the resolvents, the, the, and basically uh, the lipoxins. And all of these have a profound systemic inflammatory effect and also inhibit uh, oxidative phosphorylation themselves. They're also estrogenic. They activate the enzyme aromatase. So anything that activates the enzyme aromatase immediately puts the brakes on, on serotonin synthesis, on, on the synthesis of the protective steroids like pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA. So over time, you, you're going to get into a situation where you have chronic inflammation, high serotonin, high nitric, high, high nitric oxide, and essentially a state of, um, in both men and women, a state of a functional hypogonadism. So in other words, and I posted a, a, a link on my blog, which I can send you later. They basically, it was a study that, 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 that likened chronic low-grade endotoxemia to gelding. Basically, it said that it's almost the same as, it's not as severe as an actual castration, but it gets you pretty close to a point of being hypogonadal. And 
I don't think your listeners need any convincing that being hypogonadal, you know, whether it's for male or female, it's uh, it's really not a good situation to be in. Despite what your doctors have been telling you about, oh, androgens will give you prostate cancer, you know, they'll give you all these kind of different bad conditions. Well, study after study shows that the primary risk of a male developing cardiovascular disease is actually low testosterone. So, um, and, and, you know, many men are trying to combat this by injecting more testosterone. But like I said, if, if your endotoxin is high, aromatase expression and activity is also high. So all you're doing is you're providing more. And when you inject this testosterone, a lot of it will convert into estrogen. So you're kind of feeding the whole cycle. What really needs to be done is actually put the brakes on the endotoxin. And there are really like two main ways to do that. Uh, one of them is by killing off the bacteria that's, that's in the colon in, and potentially even in the small intestine. And probably the uh, most well-known method for doing that is taking antibiotics, right? But doctors are, are not very keen on, um, on actually prescribing antibiotics. There's a lot of talk about uh, bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Um, there's also talk about like fungal overgrowth if you overdo the antibiotics. So um, while the antibiotics is, is a great approach, most doctors shy away from it. So what, what, are, what other measures do we have? Well, you, cannot, you can take other things that inhibit bacterial overgrowth. Uh, insoluble fiber is a, is a good method. Um, things like carrot salad and, and basically bamboo shoots and pretty much any other fiber that's, that's, that's truly insoluble. Soluble fiber is horrible for, for gut health, even though many doctors say, oh, take it, it will lower your cholesterol. Yes, it will, but it will feed the bacteria like nothing else. So I will pay for this low cholesterol, uh, even if, assuming, assuming it's actually a good thing, and we can talk a lot about whether low cholesterol is good or bad. Yeah. But even if assuming it was good, it would actually cause, it would actually but it exacerbate dramatically the problem with endotoxemia. So it's insoluble fiber that actually helps to clear out some of the biofilm. And biofilm really is this like tough cluster of bacteria that is formed and attached to your intestinal wall. So it's really the, the, the insoluble fiber that, that can help clear out this, this, uh, this, this, uh, these spots of bacteria that are attached to your intestinal wall. And in general, keep the bacterial population low because it cannot be metabolized by the bacteria. Um, so second option will be to take charcoal, activated charcoal. Um, and activated charcoal itself has actually has a direct antibacterial effect. And on top of that, it can actually directly bind and absorb endotoxin. So instead of this endotoxin causing damage to your intestinal wall and potentially getting to your bloodstream, which is the worst situation, right? Um, the charcoal will bind it and you'll simply excrete it. Uh, there are multiple studies, and there are all those studies because older studies because uh, charcoal is really not in favor right now medically unless you have some kind of a poisoning, acute poisoning. Um, but studies all the way up until the 1960s, I think, uh, they show that if you if you add charcoal to the diet of animals, um, and it doesn't have to be done every day, um, twice a week is more than enough. If you add a little bit of charcoal to their diet, these animals live on average about 20 to 30 percent longer, um, wow. their maximum lifespan. So it shows you directly that endotoxin itself has a profound life shortening effect, if nothing else. Even if you don't believe in, in the metabolic theory, if, even if you don't believe that, that, that inhibited metabolism is bad for you, well, at the very least, you should believe that you know, living less long <laughs> is not good for you. Right, and that's, right. and conversely, the, the charcoal and the insoluble fiber and the antibiotics, all three of these components have been shown to actually prolong life. And both average and maximum lifespan. Um, and even without all of these things, one of the simplest things that anybody can do is whenever they're eating their food, make yeah. sure you eat foods that are easily digestible. It's actually the exact opposite to the advice that your doctor or your nutritionist with multiple PhDs will give you. Yes, these sugars may spike up your blood sugar more. Uh, well, actually, it depends on the, on, the, on the type of sugar you're eating but they will not feed the bacteria, not nearly as much as what the resistant starch will do. And actually this in the long run is better for your health than, than, feeding, than feeding the bacteria and causing this chronic low-grade uh, endotoxemia. Um, and when it comes to the diets and the easily digestible foods, um, like even something as white rice or, or you know, well-baked or well-cooked potatoes um, is actually less dangerous than something like beans uh, or lentils um, or soybeans or anything else that, that classifies as, as, uh, as, as resistant starch. Because yes, these, uh, these simple carbs, easily digestible carbs will, ra will raise your insulin and your blood sugar. Yeah, but at yeah. the end of the day, that's actually expected and it's less dangerous 
than, than, than causing the, the, uh, the chronic endotoxin overload. And you can actually do even better by simply increasing your intake, substituting these, these simple carbs like white rice and potatoes, which are turned turn into pure glucose after they get metabolized because it's mostly starch, right? Yeah. You can actually yeah. get your sugar from ripe fruit and even something like pure white table sucrose because, because the sugar in fruit tends to be mostly fructose, up to 70, in some cases, even 80% fructose. And, and the rest of the 20% are glucose and some other sugars like trecholose, uh, galactose. And those sugars actually, so because fructose doesn't have nearly the same insulin response as glucose does, by eating these sugars, you will actually not raise your insulin not nearly as much as you would by eating the white rice, the potatoes, or even the resistant starch. So if the goal is, because the recommendation for the resistant starch is you need to keep your insulin down and your blood sugar down. Well, yeah. you can do it yeah. by eating yummy, delicious things and basically that are, have a sufficient amount of fructose to balance the insulinogenic, um, you know, effects of, of, of glucose. And, and you know, the, the simplest thing you can do is eating t- white table sugar, but because, because it lacks many of the nutrients that are present in fruit, I would say eating ripe fruit is probably the preferable way to obtain most of your sugar throughout the day. But it's, it's way better than doing the resistant starch, and it's, and it's still better than doing the, uh, the easily digestible, simple, uh, you know, glucose-generating carbs like, like rice and potatoes. Got it. And so where does like honey, honey is like 70% fructose and 30% yeah. glucose about, yes. right? And also honey has got a number of different components in it that are antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. So you have, a, you have, a, you know, you have, you have every reason to eat honey instead of eating rice, potatoes, or God forbid, one of these, you know, hard to digest breads or, you know, or, or, or you know, whatever kind of, uh, you know, gory monstrosity, the, the latest, uh, you know, vegan, um, <laughs> vegan industry has come up with like, uh, what was the last thing I saw? I mean, I'm sure you've seen you've seen lentil chips, there are bean chips, yeah, there's soy yeah. chips, all kinds of things, and they're yeah. expensive. They usually cook with vegetable oil. They're they're loaded up with pufa, and and if that wasn't bad enough, the vast majority of the legumes right contain powerful chemicals that act that act like estrogen. They're called phytoestrogens, and those estrogens have been shown to be even more potent than the endogenous estrogen we produce, named called estradiol. So why would you want to eat estrogenic foods that give you men boobs, hypogonadism, and feed the endotox- the bacteria, the endotoxin producing bacteria in your gut? When, once you look deep enough, it becomes an almost a no-brainer. I mean, like there's a reason why kids crave the sweets. They yeah. like ripe fruit. They like ice cream. They like their, their, their candy and their sugar, right? I mean, uh, the modern medicine tries to excuse this with some kind of an addiction, right? But it developed over 4 billion years of evolution, potentially even more. So if you give them the right kind of sugars, the, this craving mechanism is probably there for a reason. And, and to this day, I've not met a child that, that, that falls in love with, with boiled broccoli or boiled cauliflower or boiled cabbage or all of, all of these other vegetables that are supposedly good for them. Yet actually, all of these are goitrogens. So they suppress yeah. thyroid function. So somehow children intuitively know because they trust the instincts a lot more than we do. We, we, we the grown-ups, the wise men, and I don't know if, if you know, but the, the, the word wise uh, comes from an old English word, which means, which means wrinkled and dumb. So it's kind of like the exact opposite of what really wisdom is supposed to, what we think wisdom is. But children being not wise or unwise, they appear to be much more intelligent than we are, at least when it comes to food choices. I love that. The other night we were having dinner and, and uh, Brixton, our, our son, ate a little bit of dinner and then he, we were at a, a friend's house and then he, he picked around, ate a little bit, didn't eat much. And then he went over to their fridge after dinner and he opened it up. And, and so the, our, uh, the, the people who were having us over, they said, oh, what do you want out of the fridge? And he reached for and grabbed an apple and he said, I want this oh. apple. And, uh, and they were amazed and we, we, we kind of, we, we, we weren't amazed cause that's, that's, that's kind of what we, you know, that's what we have around and he's eating fruit and, and things like that. But they were shocked that he went to the fridge and instead of looking for something else, he just grabbed an apple. That's, that's pretty good, man. I mean, like, you know, if you, if you leave kids alone, um, now the problem is like, I mean, because, because the industry tries to prey on their instincts and, and, right. and what they crave, then of course, like, you know, if you give them all of these, uh, these these candies that have um, these artificial dyes, they have like titanium dioxide, they have silicon dioxide. That's really the bad part about the candy. It's not the sugar. And that's really the, the pharmaceutical industry has done a great job, actually the, in the food industry as well, 
and they've done a great job about talking, you know, against like how, you know, saying like bad mouthing sugar and how it's really the, like the main cause of all the health problems. In reality, it's actually everything else that is in the candy. Because if you read the yeah. label on, on like a, on a typical, um, you know, a bag of candy you get from your local CVS or Rite Aid, you'll be appalled. I mean, there are things there that you will never think will be part of any, any actual food fed, fed for humans, but it's there and it's the most, it's been put mostly because it increases shelf life. Silicon dioxide is basically powder glass. Does it sound like it's something, there's something good that you want to put in your intestine? I mean, at the very least, it causes micro bleeding. And if you do it on a regular basis, um, this can lead to ulcers um, it, it, or even in very severe case, even perforation of the intestine. Like what same person would want to eat that? Or, uh, or uh, uh, talc. Uh, recently, it was, it was shown that talc in female products and in baby powder actually causes ovarian cancer. So Johnson & Johnson recently lost a class action lawsuit by I think it was like over 4,000 women who sued Johnson & Johnson because of their ovarian cancer. And the court agreed, the jury agreed and awarded, I think, several billion dollars in damages to these women. Not that you will buy them back their health. It's more of a you know, corroboration that most of these products that are out there, they really have only one, one goal in, in mind, and that's profit. It's not, not your health, it's not right. my health, it's not yours. It's not the children's health. It's not the environment even. They really, they really don't care about any of that. So, uh, so again, it's the ch children crave sweet things because it, they're, they're calorie dense. You know, basically they're pleasurable, which is good because it's part of fun. Because as you said, you know, yeah. life is not, it shouldn't be a travail. It shouldn't be this like this drudge that people keep going through. And eventually they're kind of like towards when they're 50, they're like, oh, I can't wait to die. Well, that's not what life is supposed to be like. And I don't know of any animal that behaves that way. Uh, you know, when animals are healthy, they like being alive. They like doing fun things. Um, yeah. But here's the thing. In order for you to enjoy life, in order for you to want to do fun things, you need energy because fun things is usually related to new things, right? And novelty, like everything else, it requires for you to spend energy in, terms of, in, in order to process that new information, in order to incorporate that new knowledge, because everything new adds knowledge if you know how to process it. So it's a challenge. It's basically, it's, it's almost like somebody pokes you. Every time you do something new, somebody pokes you and says, hey, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. Well, you can actually try that trick with, with an older person and a younger person. And I guarantee you, by the second time you poke an older person, they will probably punch you in the face. And they'll say, leave me, leave me the heck alone. Well, that's actually highly indicative of just how energetically depleted these people are. To young people, if you poke them, uh, depending on the child, but I've tried it actually, and most of it should take this as a some kind of a game. They want to be engaged. They'll probably turn around, poke, poke you in turn. Then they'll start chasing each other. It's it's actually a game and a fun thing. To an old person, they just want to be left alone, and and you better not poke them, or, or or they'll 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 poke you, or like a break, I don't know, a vase over your head. And 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 that's just like a very very simplistic but very indicative example of 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 basically how important energy and metabolism is just for experiencing the basic joys of life. And endotoxin strikes at the heart of that, because just like, as, as I said, every, every result of, of endotoxin overload, every, every downstream effect leads in one way or another to inhibition of, of oxidative phosphorylation. Serotonin and nitric oxide are probably the primary ones, yeah. but all these other inflammatory mediators, the prostaglandins, leukotrienes, uh, and in general, the activation of the immune system consumes ATP. So all of all of this needs to be replenished. Yet it, the the synthesis, the actual production of energy, is inhibited by by these very downstream effects of endotoxin. So it's really like if if everything in life requires energy, including the enjoyment of life, yeah. then you can immediately see how endotoxin really puts the brakes on all of that by being perhaps the main endogenous brake on metabolism. So down the road, life's less fun. We have less energy. What are some, some of the degenerative conditions that people know of that this actually manifests itself as so people get an idea? Like we're talking about all these nasty implications of endotoxin. Like, can you name some of these? I mean, we're talking about these downstream things. I mean, that everyone knows what, what are these things? So I don't, I don't know there's a, that there is any disease that endotoxin cannot actually cause either directly or through one of its mediators. I'll give an example. So. As we're getting older, um, and actually at this point, even younger people, we're seeing like a, like a drastic increase in all of these fibrotic conditions. 
Well, guess what? Serotonin is the primary cause of fibrosis in any organ or tissue inside the body, right? So whether that's that's heart failure or lung fibrosis or liver fibrosis, also known as cirrhosis, um, or, or, or it's like, oh, it's basically soft tissue fibrosis, even some of the cancers like sarcomas, all of these things can be directly caused by, by uncontrolled elevated serotonin, which mostly, and not, not, not many people know, but 90% of serotonin is synthesized in the gastrointestinal tract. And serotonin is usually only triggered serotonin synthesis when endotoxin is around. So in other words, if you have a serotonin problem, you have an endotoxin problem. And basically, um, so diabetes is now known to be tied to serotonin. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is now, is now tied to serotonin. There's actually multiple, there are multiple clinical trials right now uh, with, for, with drugs that inhibit serotonin synthesis. And the two most successful ones to date, they're still not complete, but some of the results are available. It shows that inhibited serotonin synthesis may actually reverse obesity and diabetes type 2. So serotonin is directly is an actual direct cause of these bad of, of you know these horrible conditions. Um, there are multiple clinical trials with serotonin antagonists for Alzheimer's disease and a number of different old age dementias as they call them. Alzheimer's is the type of dementia, it's the, probably the most well known one. Um, there's there also they also like uh, recently they discovered that the the primary symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the trembling, like the unsteady gait, the loss of balance. For a long time, they thought that this is caused by by lower dopamine, by loss of bit of these neurons in the brain that produce dopamine. Well, now it turns out it's actually serotonin excess that's causing all of these things. And actually, this should have been known because serotonin is known to cause muscle twitching and trembling. That and that's actually common knowledge. It's in it's studied in medical school. But for a long time, for some reason, the medical industry thought that lack of dopamine causes trembling. No, actually, lack lack of dopamine. Is, is more involved with lack of creativity, lack of desire for life, right? And all these things are still there. But it's, it turns out that serotonin is actually the primary driver of, of these neurodegenerative conditions. Um, heart failure, another fibrotic condition, definitely caused by serotonin. The company Pfizer is behind the scenes currently running clinical trials with a serotonin antagonist called Turgoride. And while at the same time, Pfizer and, and its buddies, or <laughs> the others of its ilk, are selling you and everybody else serotonergic drugs for depression. So they're selling about the poison and the remedy. So, you know, basically up, up until a year ago, it was uh, the main, the, the mainstream version was that heart fibrosis, heart failure was irreversible. Um, that pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary also accompanied by pulmonary arterial hypertension. Both of the things, th these things are, are irreversible and they're deadly, they're lethal. Most people with uh, pulmonary hypertension live two, three years and then they die. Both of these, all of these conditions, it was found out, Pfizer found out that a simple serotonin antagonist not only stops the progression, but reverses them. So, so, you, so you, can think, you can think of all of these conditions as down, downstream effects of, of chronic endotoxin, and that caused by just one of its downstream effects, which is serotonin. Nitric oxide is another one. It's no, even though it's given to people with, uh, with hypertension problems or cardiovascular disease, it was found out decades later that these drugs, even though they improve the immediate symptoms because nitric oxide is, has a vasodilating effect, they actually contributed to the to the destruction of the cardiovascular system. And eventually, most people who are on some kind of a, nit a nitric oxide releasing drug, like nitroglycerin, is is a famous one, right? It's actually a component of explosives. These people usually die of their heart disease, while people who actually le let uh, leave their heart disease untreated. They tend to live a lot longer and often do not die from the heart disease, but die from something else. So nitric oxide, it's, it's one, actually two known um, physiological functions that can be accepted as somewhat positive. Well, number one, the destruction of foreign pathogens, right? So if you have a bacterial infection, viral, any, anything else that the body thinks sh shouldn't be there, then nitric oxide is the primary weapon. It comes at a cost, like I said, it inhibits metabolism. The second role of nitric oxide is if you're not producing enough carbon dioxide, then, then basically nitric oxide becomes the emergency vasodilating molecule. So if the body, if you're under some kind of a stress and the body needs to pump more blood and get it to the organs, and if you basically, if your blood vessels are stiff and they don't expand easily, then the body will, up, will ramp up the production of nitric oxide as an emergency mechanism to get the blood flowing. But guess what? You don't, again, you don't want this to be happening chronically because over time, Nitric oxide itself not only inhibits uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, 
but it also activates the conversion of the PUFA into all of the other inflammatory mediators. And nitric oxide and estrogen and serotonin have a very intimate positive feedback relationship. All three promote the release of each other and also histamine. So you have serotonin, histamine, nitric oxide, estrogen, and cortisol. All of these are part of the stress response. All of these have a valid physiological function when you truly are under attack or, or, or under some kind of a stress. But guess what? Because there, there are these, uh, what should I call them, like, the, uh, like the, the nuclear option, right, as a weapon. Like, I mean, think about, do you think it's a good idea to launch, to, to start every war just at the very beginning? You launch a nuclear weapon, I mean, very soon you're not going to have a world, right? Well, the same thing, the exact same thing happens in the organism as well. If you're using the nuclear option for every problem you have or you ever face, that's not a good sign. I mean, the body starts to, it basically takes, it, it sees the writing on the wall, for lack of a better word, and starts to really, de- by, I don't want to use the word degenerate, but it starts to shut off all of your higher functions, all of your higher cognitive functions, specifically reproductive function and the health of any organ that is not considered vital. So that's why with aging, you're seeing a general decline in cognitive function, in skin quality. All organs start to fail if they're not considered relevant, right? And at some point, not relevant, but but vital to life. And at some point, even the vital ones start to fail simply because they all depend on proper energy production. And that stays low for as long as you either have endotoxin high or one of its downstream um, you know, uh, uh, mediators is elevated for one reason or another. Got it. Well, it's it's interesting because as you're talking, you're answering along the way a lot of the questions that pop up in my head. Um, but but one question I had, um, it, it kind of rounding back to the very the beginning of endotoxin creation, um, and you're talking about eating easily digestible foods. Um, as as far as uh, experimenting and and knowing what is digestible, what makes me feel good. Um, I mean I mean I know it's it's got to taste good. Um, what are some signs that someone can know that someone, something is, is actually easily digestible as far as food? So anytime you eat food, if you start feeling bloated, sluggish, irritable, um, basically low on energy, well, low on energy is a little bit, is, is a little bit of a misnomer because it is, it is normal for you if, you, if your insulin spikes up after a meal, it's normal to feel sleepy. But if you're feeling constantly tired, um, if, like, if your muscle tone is not good, if you're feeling fatigued, uh, if you're feeling irritable, irritability is a great sign that your intestine is also irritated. Um, and also, especially if you're having trouble sleeping and the quality of your dreams is suffering, such as having bizarre or weird or even like traumatic dreams, that's a great sign that serotonin is elevated and adrenaline is elevated as well. And these two are the primary drivers behind you know, the lack of restorative sleep. And like I said, serotonin can't really, doesn't really prop up its early hit its ugly head unless endotoxin was somehow increased as well. So if you're eating, if whatever food you eat, if, if afterwards your mood suddenly sours uh, and, and you kind of like you start you start seeking solitude, which is a, another great sign, basically, it's just a sign that you don't have energy to cope with the world, right? You want to be left alone, you want to curl up, and you kind of want to just get get through the day and, and you know, and call it a day. Well, <laughs> if your endotoxin stays low, that becomes your entire life. You just want to you know, we want to curl up and call it a life. So we, we don't want that, right? And, and you know, like I said, skin quality, like if you start getting random rashes on your skin, blisters, um, uh, aging, they call them aging spots, but really these aging spots are, are uh, the kept, the medical name is lipofuscin. Yeah. And lipofuscin it actually forms when you have a high PUFA uh, load in your, in your tissues and a high iron concentration. So under the influence of endotoxin, uh, basically, PUFA and iron interact, and they form this this basically peroxidized molecule, and and that's what becomes. It's really hard to break, and and it gets not only in your skin, but it gets into your into your organs as well. And it's also a, another uh, strong break on metabolism as well. There have been efforts going on since the 1950s trying to remove endoto- uh, lipofuscin from the cell because it's been shown that as soon as you remove that lipofuscin, basically the metabolism of the cell is restored. So it's almost like a, it's like a permanent endotoxin thing that ends up inside of your cells. And it happens under the influence of the real endotoxin, which is coming from the bacteria. Um, not many components are known to, to affect endotoxin, but the two that are known are vitamin E. Uh, it's, it's capable, in some cases, of dissolving the lipofuscin and getting it out of the cell. And the second one is actually alcohol. 
but only in moderate concentrations. So multiple studies have shown that about one to two drinks a day um, is capable of reducing an, uh, lipofuscin uh, load in, in your cells and tissues. But anything more than that actually exacerbates it. And that's because alcohol in moderate amounts acts as a solvent, right? It can get into your tissues and it can actually dissolve, literally dissolve this lipofuscin and get it out. But in higher amounts, it triggers the exact same. Actually, in higher amounts, it increases gut permeability, right? So it, it helps more endotoxin get into the bloodstream and also increases lipolysis, suppresses glucose metabolism, glucose metabolism uh, incre increases lipid peroxidation. So that all of these things are crucial for the formation of even more lipofuscin. So don't overdo the alcohol, but in small to moderate amounts, it's actually potentially good for you. And that's what studies actually so far confirm that moderate, light to moderate drinkers tend to outlive the heavy ones and the teetotalers by about 15 years. Wow. So I doubt it's a coincidence. Where can something like, uh, can red light, baking soda, uh, uh, well, red light or baking soda, what about coconut oil? Are these things that can play a therapeutic role in, in keeping endotoxin low or mitochondrial respiration? Sure. So coconut oil has known potent antibacterial effects that are just the property of the fatty acids that are inside of it. Lauric acid, which is a major component of, of coconut oil, and caprylic acid. Both of these are medium-chain saturated fatty acids, and they actually have a direct uh, bacteri bacterial toxic effect. The problem is they get very easily digested. So the, the, the key is to get enough of them down to the colon where they, where can, where they can actually exert the direct endotoxin effect. And one way it has been shown to, be, to happen is that if you mix the coconut oil with insoluble fiber, because they basically mix and, and, and the coconut oil is not digested and the fiber carries it all the way down to the intestine and that's where it can both the fiber and the coconut oil can exert an antibacterial effect. Another way is to take the coconut oil with a little bit of charcoal. The same thing happens. The charcoal, the charcoal absorbs to the coconut oil. They form this mixture that's indigestible. And again, it gets carried down all the way down to the intestine and again both the charcoal and the coconut oil uh, can exert their uh, their antibacterial effects red light doesn't have a direct an anti endotoxin effect but it does have a potent nitric oxide anti-nitric oxide effect and nitric oxide is a very reactive molecule it has the nasty habit of forming a very strong bond with one of the crucial enzymes of respiration known as cytochrome c oxidase mm -hmm. and basically once that bond is formed there are very few things that can break it. And while the bond is there, your cell really cannot respire normally. You, 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 you're you operating at about, about 60% capacity of what the cell can really do, often less than that, right? And the, the two things that are known to be able to get nitric oxide out of there, uh, one of them is red light, and the second one is methylene blue, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a very, uh, it's, it, it serves as, a, as an electron acceptor. It's similar to oxygen in its effects, but it can get inside the cell and do beneficial things when, when, when oxygen is either not available or in cases like the nitric oxide blocking cytochrome C oxidase, oxygen cannot help even if it's inside the cell. But methylene blue can. So those are two things. Other quinones like emodine in cascara, vitamin K, um, the tetracycline antibiotics, they can potentially um, you know, also have benefit against serotonin, nitric oxide, and of course the tetracycline antibiotics, which are both quinones and antibiotics, they can help keep the bacterial count down as well. So they have both, they have the direct effect both on the bacteria, which is, so they lower endotoxin, and also the downstream effects of endotoxin as well. Got it. Wow, and then baking soda is in a similar boat with, with opposing. Yes, so, so baking soda helps because, uh, first of all, it was a uh, recent study found that baking soda mixed with some organic acids like acetic acid, which is in vinegar, right? or citric acid, which is in most of the citrus fruit. So when, when, you, when they administer either one of these components, baking soda or some of the organic acids, when they administer them separately, they did not have much effect on, on bacterial growth, right? But when they were administered together, they had a potent synergistic effect, and actually tiny concentrations of these components when used together act, act almost like an antibiotic. So a great uh, tool to try would be Put it like a, a spoon of ba uh, a teaspoon of, teaspoon of baking soda in a glass of orange juice, but do it slowly because it's going to start to fizzle, right? Because it will react with the with the acids inside of the orange juice. But afterwards, you have it will have a very nice tangy taste, and it will be carbonated too, which many people yeah. like. And that's a great way to actually keep endotoxin at bay. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, all of, there, there are many tools, uh, and, and most of the steps are simple. Eat easily digestible foods, and basically, you know, if you feel like, watch what you're eating, watch for symptoms and signs of change digestion, change mood, change skin quality, change dreams, right? Change quality of dreams and quality of sleep. And these things will guide you whether the, food you, the foods you're eating are really beneficial for you or not. So I kind of was laughing when you were talking about the baking soda and like orange juice because it's happened too many times to count now and I obviously haven't learned. But like it'll fizz up like over the glass and then like all over the counter, you know, because the orange juice is, is filled to the brim and then I put baking soda in it. Um, so I have to remind myself if I'm if I'm mixing it with juice, I have to, you know, a little bit of juice, mix the baking soda, maybe add some water or whatever. Yeah. I laugh when you said that. Yeah, that's, you know, don't just dump directly the spoon in there because <laughs> you'll, you'll, uh, you'll overflow. I, it happened to me a few times too. <laughs> but maybe a nice experiment. I mean, children tend to love it. So if you want oh, to yeah. impress a child, yeah. Well, well that's <laughs> the thing I love, the, I love about all of this is, is we're, we're, we are the best arbiter of what's going on with ourselves and how, how the things that we are doing is reacting or, or the, the, the effects of what we're doing. And, and it's, it's constant experiment. Like all of this is really getting to know like what we're doing and how it's affecting us. And, and ultimately, like all this stuff that you're talking about, ideally leads to just a better life, right? Like having more fun. I mean, isn't that the point? So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's the point, but if you want that to happen, yeah. then, then energy is crucial. Energy, I mean, it should, it should be at this point a no-brainer, really, that energy is crucial for every aspect of your life, yeah. including life as well. Not many people know, but the way anesthetics work, right? Um, and not many people also know is that anesthetics don't put you to sleep, they actually put you in a coma. So, so the way they work is they basically immediately inhibit the synthesis of ATP in the brain. They yeah. inhibit oxidative metabolism. So even so, uh, the reason I'm giving this example is that uh, energy is, is important even for life itself. Yeah. So, and then you know, conversely, the more energy you produce, the more alive you will be, for lack of a better word. So you cannot really experience joy from life because joy is the biochemical underpinnings of joy have to do with things like, you know, high dopamine, high pregnenolone, high progesterone, low cortisol, low estrogen, all of the, in order for all of these things to happen, for all of these things, energy is required. Keeping stress down is both a concerted effort on your part, which by the way, requires energy. And yeah. also how we react to stress is also determined by your energetic reserves. So energy is really the universal currency. I mean, both in our external lives, in a form of electricity and in our internal lives in a form of ionic electric and in form in the form of electric energy derived from the ions that we get from food so it's really it's really fun, fundamental to life in general and if you want to enjoy life if you want to be productive if you want to be create creative and if you want to live longer healthier lives making sure that 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 the the production of energy is is as uninhibited as possible should be really like a, like a pr the primary concern in life. I love that. Yeah, and 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 almost I, I just thought of this ironically too. Like if we want to see that life is something that needs to be changed, we need to have the high energy to descend, to change right? it, to change exactly. the status quo. And I, I don't know if you want to touch on this briefly before we close, but like I know Ray Pete has written about it a bunch, um, where where throughout periods of history or different writers. Or different artists who were who were challenging the status quo seem to be uh, very biologically energetic people. Yeah, and, and uh, but I want to make a distinction because there are two kinds of people that, that bring change. Some of them yeah. bring it through violence, and others bring it through in a constructive way, um, right. and, and in a disruptive but constructive way, right? Yeah. And it's really the second kind that we're talking about here because um, actually, when if somebody is oppressed to the point where they don't care whether they live or die. They will bring up change, all right, right? But you know, guess what they'll do? They'll pick up a gun and shoot up a school, or God forbid, or like, or do something else that's crazy. That's still change. Yeah, um, yeah. It's not. It's not really good change, and it's not the kind of change you want to be pushing for because it's done out of desperation, and it rarely leads to anything good, right? The kind of change we're talking about is more subtle, but potentially much more profound because it affects the lives of so many more people. And the way this happens is by usually by increasing not the, the knowledge of mankind. In order for you to synthesize new knowledge, which always comes from matter, always comes from the external world, in order for you to synthesize new knowledge, that also requires energy. So, so if you want to be a disruptive force, 
um, you have to, I mean, all of these people, there were uh, people like William Blake or Leonardo da Vinci or even Bertrand Russell, or even uh, Albert Einstein. All of these people came from backgrounds where they basically, they were left, they were left alone. Nobody was forcing them to do what they didn't want to do. They had enough resources at their disposal to pursue their interests. And, and they, they didn't really lead lives where they had to worry about the next day, how they're going to pay the health insurance, whether they'll have, they'll, they'll have enough to eat or feed their families. None of these things that are really glorified in our culture these days, this constant strive for survival, that's really one of the biggest lies that's been told in biology ever, is that somehow constant, constantly striving to survive somehow leads to a better life and makes you a better human being, a better organism. That's not true. Uh, if you look at nature... Actually, usually exertion and strife leads to the generation of the species, not the generation of new species, not the improvement of the existing species. It's usually in times of in times of uh, you know um, uh, of dirt, in in, ti in times of scarcity. Usually, this brings out the worst uh, in animals. I mean, um, and you know the the, the you, you can tell this by that the average size of the animal declines. Um, they actually they they start having more more children, more offspring, but not many of these survive. And the ones that survive have, have basically more compromised health than their parents do. And we're kind of seeing this right now in, in, the, in the current generations. I mean, basically, the, the, the generation that lived throughout the First World War, it's known as the greatest generation. And then came the silent generation. They came the boomers, right? All of these people, if you look at their, like, basically the both of their maximum lifespan and their death statistics, we've seen a dramatic decline in average health over the last hundred years. So, which shows you that whatever it is that we're doing, <laughs> it's not improving the life of the populace, and and a change is needed. But uh, in order for us to enact change, we need to be cognizant of the energy aspect. I love that. Yeah, that that's great, Georgie. Uh, I think this has been wonderful. Uh, I think I think this is kind of what we are aiming for as far as a time length. Um, if someone wants to read more of your work, because you're constantly putting out good stuff. You're constantly digging up studies. You're even you're even uh, doing your own studies now. You've you found a way to fund your own studies. Uh, if you want to talk about that, that'd be amazing. Um, but where can someone learn more about what you're doing? Because you're constantly putting stuff out there. So I have a blog, and I have a Twitter account. And that's probably like the easiest way to find well, the things that I write. Okay. Um, and I post online under the moniker Hadut. It's spelled H A I D as in dog, U T as in Tom. So my website is heydut.me, M-E, and then my Twitter account is Twitter slash heydut, right? So it's, these are pretty easy to find. And also post on the repeat forum under the same moniker, heydut. So basically all of the studies that I find and I post on my blog, you can find them on the blog, on the Twitter, or, or the repeat forum. Um, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So after I get these two studies that I'm, going, that I'm doing right now, if, if they ever make it to publication, I will post them on the blog as well. Um, so I'm pretty hopeful for both of them, and we'll see what happens. I mean, um, eventually, just as I realized, if you want change, uh, I think Gandhi once said, be the change yeah. you want to see in the world. Yeah. So after I waited for, for a change for a long time and realized that in, as far as health, uh, you know, nutrition, medicine, you know, nothing, nothing new is going to come out under the, the, the iron grip of the current system, that I have to take matters into, the, into my own hands in my own little small way. So that's what I'm doing really right now with these new studies. I'm trying to generate new knowledge that's going to be not mine, but it will be. It will not be biased by anybody else. And you'll be amazed at how much bias and how much political interest is concentrated in these studies that most people take as pure science, and they're not. They're actually anything but science. Most of the time, they're done to please one or another commercial entity, right, and or promote the career of the people that are involved. They're really very rarely... Science these days is done just for the sake of science. And I'm hoping that I'll have the opportunity to continue to do science for the sake of science. And uh, people will benefit from that. I love that. And, and, and do you care to speak about your name, hey, hey Dude? Like, I thought that was really interesting when I learned about kind of what that means. I don't know if that ties in, but I, I thought that was really cool. Do you want to talk about what that, that means, Hey Dude? Yeah, so I'm originally from Bulgaria, and Bulgaria was under Ottoman um, uh, conquering, uh, under Ottoman presence, and really we call it slavery because the, the Ottoman Empire was, ba was basically treating the conquered nations almost like slaves um, for 500 years. And during that time, the resistance that, that, that the Bulgarians put up 
against the Ottomans was in the form of these bands of of, of guerrilla fighters. And they lived in the mountains and they were attacking like uh, you know military convoys that the Ottomans were sending around the empire. They were you know blocking roads, you know doing these like like daring raids, then disappearing to the mountains. They were known as the Hadouts. So Hader really is like, it's just a it's just a Bulgarian version of a freedom fighter or a rebel. Uh, I don't know if I'm a rebel without a cause, <laughs> but I think everybody can easily see that in the current environment, some kind of rebellion is necessary because if we leave the system to its own devices, the system will gladly destroy us all or at least turn us into some kind of a prophet without much concern for our health and our life. I love it. That's that's just that's awesome. All right, Georgie. Well, th thank you for being with us and uh, sharing your time and your knowledge and your experience and, and your energy. And uh, it's just been great. So until until next time. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Of course. Yeah. Awesome. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. See ya. See ya.